Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here for this masterclass with uh, Montani Levy, Montana Levy Blanco and Mar Cookie Jordan. My name is Aaron Malkin. I'm the literary director and dramaturg at New York Theatre Workshop. Uh, and we are so grateful to have you here today. Um, to start, I wanted to say that um, New York Theatre Workshop has long sought to create art that interrogates our past as a way of understanding the present and shining light toward the future. Um, to that end, we're taking the time to recognize the history of the land we occupy in the East Village. And as we find ourselves in the digital space, we'd like to embrace the opportunity to acknowledge the many native lands from which we're all tuning in. We're posting a resource in the chat uh, to learn about where you are situated. And we invite everybody to take a moment and post in the chat about the native land from which you are joining us. New York Theatre Workshop on the island of Manhattan is on the island of Manhattan, and we acknowledge the island as the traditional lands of the Muncie Lenape, the Canarsie, the Ukachog, the Matanikok, the Shenikok, the, the Gawank, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Thank you for writing in to the chat. Um, the masterclass today is part of New York Theatre Workshop's virtual programming series, which is free and available to the entire New York Theatre Workshop community. And we are so grateful that in these times that community has extended beyond folks who are able to visit us on 4th Street. Um, we've asked Montana and Cookie to share an organization that is meaningful to them today that we can amplify. And if you're in the pos position to do so, we hope you're considering making a donation in honor of this class to the New Mexico Community Foundation Native American Relief Fund, a fund that provides emergency grants to tribal communities and some of the hardest hit families and communities impacted by COVID-19 across the Navajo, Apache, and Pueblos of New Mexico. You'll find a link in the chat to donate to the New Mexico Community Foundation as well as to New York Theater Workshop uh, in the chat and in the comments on Facebook Live. The class will be around an hour today, followed by a 15 minutes or so of Q&A. Uh, when we get to the Q&A, if you would like to submit a question, you can use the Q&A feature of the webinar. Um, you, if you see a question that you like, you can upload the question in Zoom and you can like the question on Facebook and we'll do our best to get to all of the questions that we can. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Montana and Cookie. Uh, Cookie Jordan is a hair, wig, and makeup designer. Her Broadway credits include Fela, The Motherfucker with the Hat, Lombardi, The Miracle Worker, A View from the Bridge, and South Pacific. Other credits include The White Noise, World, White Noise, Rural George, You Nero, King Lear, Neighbors, The Wiz at City Center, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamco, and The Wiz at the Dallas Theater Center, Hurt Village, Angels in America at Signature Theater, Cunning Little Vixen, Le Grand Macabre at the New York Philharmonic, Liberty Smith, 1776 at Ford's Theater, and with New York Theater Workshop, The House That Will Not Stand, and Slave Play. Montana is a costume designer from Albuquerque, New Mexico. His grandmother, a lampshade artisan, inspired an early love of fabric, color, and beauty. Montana is a gra graduate of the Oberlin Conservatory of Music, Oberlin College, Brown University, and the Yale School of Drama. He's a recipient of two drama desks, Sam Norton, the Lucille Lortel, two Henry Hughes, and two Obie Awards. Selected off-Broadway credits include A Strange Loop at Playwrights Horizons, Fairview Is God Is at Soho Rep, Ain't No Mo at The Public, Fabulation, Death of the Last Black Man and In the Blood at Signature, Fefu and Her Friends, and He Brought Her Heart Back in a Box at Tafana, Pipeline, Ghost Light and War at Lincoln Center, Daddy at the Vineyard and the New Group, Dragon Springs, Phoenix Rise at The Shed, Eddie and Dave at the Atlantic, Orange Julius at Rattlesick page 73, Distance is Smaller at the Advanced Beginner Group, The Last Match at Roundabout, O Earth at the Foundry, and with New York Theater Workshop, Red Speedo, The House That Will Not Stand, and Nat Turner in Jerusalem. Um, it is a pleasure now to welcome Montana and Cookie. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi. 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 Hello, I will disappear and just call on me as you need me, but I am right here. Okay, go Montana. Okay, um, well, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, when Cookie and I were asked to 
do this conversation or facilitate this conversation, um, I think mostly what we wanted to elaborate on was um, our um, uh, collaboration and our process and how we find these characters um, uh, that inhabit these plays. So in thinking about um, uh, specifying two projects that we wanted to talk through, um, we're gonna talk uh, uh, at first about The Death of the Last Black Man in the Whole Entire World, AKA The Negro Book of the Dead, which is by Susan Laurie Parks. Um, and this is a show we did in 2016 um, with uh, the Signature Theater. And the second play that we're gonna be talking about is um, Marcus Gardley's The House That Will Not Stand, uh, which we did in 2018 at um, the workshop. Um, Cookie, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, how we met? Yeah, um, a lot of times, you know, you, you meet costume designers um, through other people. So Montana was designing Death of the Last Black Man and the signature theater, I guess, asked you if they had, if you had a wig person that you worked with. And then they arranged for me to meet Montana. And we met in the lobby of the signature. And it was like kismet. <laughs> it was, um, Montana is from Albuquerque and I've lived in Santa Fe for over 40 years. That's where I am now. And so we had a connection with our love of New Mexico. And we just sat and we just started talking about red chili and green chili and his grandma. <laughs> and that's how it started. Um, so I have, to, I have to disclose that um, the first time I ever, I actually didn't even meet Cookie then. I was working um, at Eric Winterling's as, as a, um, a shopper. Oh, yeah. And I remember there was this hectic week where the color purple was in there and the whiz was in there. And I remember that, um, um, oh, and Eric Winterling's, he's a costume shop in, in, in New York City. And I, and I uh, remember Cookie coming in for fitting with Queen Latifah and I just was so enamored uh, <laughs> with this woman who came in the door. And so I, you know, I secretly really wanted to meet Cookie and work with her. Um, and so when Signature gave me the opportunity, which was um, one of the first times that I was able um, to, you know, th there's not always, and Cookie and I, we can talk about this as well, but you know, as a young costume designer, you're not always given the option or the support to um, have a hair and makeup person. Um, sometimes the play doesn't necessarily um, require that overtly, but I think that there's a lot of times when um, even if it's uh, not an overt uh, part of the narrative, there's, there's a lot of ways in which hair and support, hair and makeup support is essential. And so this was the first time that I got to work with Cookie and I realized like it was this whole holistic process. I found like it was like a whole new world of discovery that we were going through. Um, so shall we talk about Death of the Last Black Man? Yes. Why don't um, you, you have the slides? Yeah. Eric, How we Eric. started? Yeah. So, Death of the Last, Death of the Last Black Man is a, it's a textual meditation, prayer, rumination on, um, the history of Black peoples in America, and specifically the the dangers um, uh, both in the past and obviously now of being a Black man in America. Um, and so uh, 
in, dis, in fi, trying to figure out how we wanted to approach these archetypes, um, I developed collages. And so I'm part of what I wanted to do today is take you through um, our visual world. So there's a lot of visual information that Cookie and I um, sift through and put together uh, in order to bring these characters to life. So I'm gonna let you in a little bit to our kind of visual inspirations and world. So um, part of what's uh, very uh, powerful and interesting about Death of the Last Black Man is that each of the characters have names um, such as uh, well, uh, Black Man with Watermelon. We can go to the next slide. So this is one of the collages that I did. Um, and we can go to the next, which is Black Woman with Fried Chicken. Um, we can go to the next, which is lots of grease, lots of pork. Um, so the archetype of the minstrel. Um, the next slide is a drawing. So I kind of um, uh, filtered these ideas in the collage into the succinct drawing, which is, you know, because ultimately um, what we do has to have like a, 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 a it has a physical <laughs> end and a physical means, but it starts out very theoretical. Um, the next slide is um, in the process of making this. Um, and part of what we wanted to do um, was uh, to tell the history of these archetypes. Um, we thought about the metaphor of, um, of distress and almost like if there was soot and distress on some of these um, really overt and racist archetypes that the, the soot, the dirt, would represent kind of its journey through the American story. So this is before, obviously, uh, it was uh, distressed, but I just wanted to show you the, the process image. The next uh, slide is um, Yes and Green's Black Eyed Peas Cornbread. The next is Old Man River Jordan. Um, who, you know, when I was, when Lily, and Lil, when I was talking with, through this with Liliana and Susan Laurie, you know, li, both Liliana and I were not sure exactly who Old Man River Jordan was. And Susan Laurie said, well, he's the street sage. And I immediately said, oh, the street sage is the pimp. Um, and so I started looking at that legacy of, uh, uh, of pimp attire, um, yeah. The next slide is Prunes and Prisms, um, which is a character that uh, repeats prunes and prisms, prunes and prisms as a elocution exercise of uh, articulating um, and colonizing, basically colonizing her, her speech patterns. And so I remember this, uh, I immediately had this vision of the famous Norman, Nor, uh, Norman Rockwell painting. And I, and, and, I, and I just felt that there was something really beautiful um, and, uh, and also disturbing about putting this character in um, a little girl's dress like that. Um, so the next slide is the sketch. Um, and the next slide is a character and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And he is actually the character in the production who um, is lynched during, during the show. And, you know, Liliana and I went back and forth a lot about what, what kind of imagery we wanted to use, but we felt like there was no way other than to speak to the problems of now. Um, so now um, the character that I wanted to talk through um, in terms of the collaboration with me and Cookie is Queen then Pharaoh Hatshepsut. 
Um, and she was played by the incredible Amelia Workman. Um, and so the collage that I developed for this, I, I, uh, I realized, I was like, who are, who, if, the, if, if Queen Ben Farrell Hatshepsut is the queen of this world, who, who is our, our modern queens? And I, you know, I live in Bed-Stuy and I looked around and there's just so many um, beautiful women of color um, who express themselves through clothing that I was like, that's our queen. And so that was kind of my um, immediate uh, inspiration. And so we can go to the next slide, which was the collage. The next slide is, um, and see, this is, the, this is the imagery that I showed Cookie, and then we kind of like develop our own take on what this is. So this, of course, is Queen Latifah in the early 90s. And then uh, the next slide um, is Dolly Parton. And I, I remember, I sometimes I see these silhouettes and these dresses and I save these images. And I just loved the silhouette so much. Um, and, you know, and so I decided to use that. And I, I included that because it's like a lot of times our um, research and our inspirations come from um, a myriad of places. You know, Death of the Last Black Man, yes, is dealing with Blackness, is dealing um, with telling, uh, sharing Black stories, but also can be inspired in part by Dolly Parton. So the <laughs> next, the next um, sketch is, uh, is the sketch. And then we have um, these up close images of Amelia. And I want Cookie to kind of talk through how we developed um, um, what this look. Well, I was talking to, um, when I was talking to Montana and he showed me the collages, the collages sort of informed me of a feeling of this as more than what it looked like, you know? And it was, I thought, wow, a queen and, and he's from Bed-Stuy and I'm originally from Bed-Stuy. And I just decided that this queen should have every sort of braid on her head is what I thought. It was like, how many different ways can you braid it? You can braid it a flat braid, you can twist it, you can make it a small braid. And I want it to really exemplify, because during that time, the women were really, the braids were getting longer and they were getting really, really fabulous. So this is, she's wearing a wig, believe it or not, with this crown on the wig. The, the crown is all of the braids in the metal. That's a separate piece that sits, we put the wig on her and then we sit that on top. And it was just sort of, it was so much fun and so much, the challenge was how do you do it and it's not heavy. So the metal is not metal and the braids are not, human hair, they're synthetic hair, so that they're much lighter than the human hair wig that she's wearing underneath it. And that's, yeah, it just, I just wanted to get it. It got to a point where I was like, you know, I wanna get it as tall as possible, but make sure she can walk out the door in the, in the wings. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the height. It was like, how tall can this be? And she can still, leave in a fire drill outdoor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I think that this was, cause this was our first show that we ever did together. And I, it was just such an amazing evolution of um, kind of ideas. And then also we had to figure out, we had the idea, but then we had to figure out the um, infrastructure the engineering mm -hmm. to make this happen. Cause you know, in these still images, what you don't see is that there was 
a lot of movement um, uh, by for her, uh, yeah, by the incredible Raja Feather Kelly, who incidentally is uh, also choreographed the house that will not stand. Um, but there was a lot of movement in the show, and so in order to execute this idea, um, it, it 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 took. Um, a level of collaborating that was um, new and I think it, it, and exciting for, for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, shall we move on to the house that will not stand? Sure. So the house that will not stand is a uh, story based on the house of Bernada Alba um, about free women of color in 1813 in New Orleans. And this is about a decade after uh, the French had sold the territory to the United States. So there's a small period of time when free women of color really experienced um, uh, a certain amount of freedom, liberty, um, uh, a lot of them were in engagements with rich white men, which is like a part of the story, um, because what happens is, is the husband dies and essentially all of these free women of color who are left um, are on the precipice of uh, an America that would uh, enslave them and they would lose those freedoms. So that's um, the genesis of the story for The House That Will Not Stand. Um, now, Cookie and I, I think The House That Will Not Stand has six women of color on stage, most often together. Um, and one thing that was important is that, and Cookie really brought this up, and we really do this on all our shows, and it doesn't, it doesn't actually, um, it's not actually like a race-based thing. We, this is something that we do on, on every project that, that we do is that we really want to tailor um, the look, the hair, everything that we're doing, we're, to, we're also in collaboration with the performer. Um, and, and so in a lot of ways, uh, the way in which um, the design develops, it's a, it's a, a, a living thing. It's, it's, uh, it's constantly evolving um, through, many, through many influences. The, there's uh, the director and the conversations we've had prior to being in the room. Um, and there's the relationship with the actor. And thankfully, you know, Cookie and I have, um, beautiful directors that we work with, Liliana Blaine Cruz, uh, Sarah Benson, Danya Tamor, that um, are, are, there's a lot of trust in the collaboration and it feels like there's always a constant conversation about how we're crafting and molding these characters. And so um, very thankful to have those relationships in this collaborative environment. Um, so um, I can take you through some of the research uh, for this. Um, and then um, I have, we put together images of the wigs disembodied and then um, the wigs on the, on the performer. So Cookie, we can talk about um, the, the entire process of everything that goes into it. So um, free women of color at this time, it was very popular to wear tignons, um, which were head wraps that covered the hair. Um, and often they were uh, made out of beautiful silk fabrics. They would be adorned with jewels and feathers. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and for this show, I really wanted to, um, to draw from uh, images in art history um, and, Im and images of those times to pull 
uh, for these free women of color. So the next slide. And go to the next one. And the next. And so something that's also, I just want to point out, as we did it, as we, that we engaged in the real story on stage, that all of these images um, are different shades. Uh, everybody has a different shade skin tone. And the politics of this time, I mean, it's a huge part of the story. Um, in terms of the um, gradient, right, and the privileges that go along with uh, uh, with being lighter skin. Um, and so one of the things that Cookie and I talked about in preparing this is also developing individual um, textures and identities um, that would be, um, that we would uh, have the actors have on their wigs. The next images I want to show you are, um, you know, when we're, I, we, we knew that we wanted this show to be um, period and authentic to um, the silhouette. So even though we used some uh, more modern fabrics with some, sometimes there's some um, a little iridescent or different shades of warm blacks and cool blacks. And, you know, I tried to use a lot of textures of blacks because we're in mourning. Um, but uh, everything really stayed true to the um, historical silhouette. So um, go to the next one. Um, and, you know, I just want to point, when we was going through the research and like developing this with Liliana, I, I also am like, when I look through these historical, um, through this historical imagery, I'm very often attracted to things that would be hip now. Um, and the, so there's ways in which you can look through these historical images and find silhouettes or things that reference um, uh, our, our identity clothes now. Um, the next image um, is undergarments. There's a fair amount of, of scenes in which we saw the women unclothed um, or disrobed and, uh, and also without their tignon. So this was a converse, this is one of the conversations. There's a constant hair journey that's happening with the house that will not stand um, and of the characters. In the next slide. And party dresses, the next slide. And the next. And so now I'll let Cookie take over. We have um, the images of the wigs and then the image of the actor in the wig. Um, so um, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> the thing is Linda played the mother of three daughters. Was it three daughters? Three? three yes. Daughters. Three daughters. And they all had different shades of skin tone, which was beautiful. And it, she had, you know, the hairstyle is a very period Gibson. And so it was, I, what I literally did was try and found the hair that matches Linda's natural hair and then just styled it into a Gibson. And one of the challenges was hats on and off and these tignons on and off. And we also see them come in in a fancy one and we see them take it off on stage and worrying about what does that hair look like when the tignon comes off. And there's also a moment in the show where one of the women, the mother cuts her hair off on stage. So that was one of the, um, I don't know what order these slides are in. Can I see the next slide? And that's Linda in full costume in the wig. And it was pretty good. Then the next character was, um, 
Lever, a neighbor, a little nosy neighbor, and trying to show that black hair has many textures, many colors. So uh, Marie Thomas is very light skin. And one of the things that as a wig designer, I, I always try and I want people to understand skin color will inform you of the texture that should be on the head, except for in rare cases, you know, where you are. But she wore a hair color that was the lightest hair color on stage and the silkiest hair on stage. And that was on purpose. I wanted to show that she had a lot more white in her and it affected the texture of her hair. I'll take the next slide. These are the two together. And if you can see, even though they're both light-skinned women, one has a different tone, uh, skin tone than the other. Linda seems to be more grounded in black. This one is more grounded in white. And I went, I did it on purpose so that the two of them, they're about the same, they're, you know, the characters were about the same age, but I just wanted to show that, you know, there is that the drops of black and how it informs your hair and that type of thing. And I think this is something that Cookie and I do on every show is mm -hmm. we sit back and we kind of uh, look at the characters together and look to see if there is a diversity of textures. I've learned so much about hair texture and, and, and nuance, and it does feel like a lot of what we're focused on is kind of um, designing these, the minutia, the minutia that then helps tell the bigger story. Okay, the next slide. Okay, Michelle. Michelle has, um, she's a darker skinned actress, but in her, she was kept up in an attic in a room because she was supposed to be crazy. But I chose to put her in a hair texture that was a little more, um, silkier and, and much, and, and, and quite long because in telling the story is she doesn't really get her hair done and she has beautiful hair, um, which is one of the storylines in the story. And so I chose to put her in a silkier hair, which I normally wouldn't do for a woman of that skin color, but to pull it off, it had, it, the color had to be right. So it is a color called number one and one B mixed together to have it to be the darkest, the, the blackest hair on stage. We see her and her to help tell the story that she's, she, she's a little crazy. And so here she is. And it was just, you know, they kept her in the attic. And yeah, and talking to the actress, you know, she had clear thoughts about what she thought that character looked like. So we came up with this look. And so this is Jonice. Jonice is the one, was Jonice the one that got her hair cut on stage, she right? She is, yeah. She gets her hair cut by her mother because her hair is her crown. Um, the mother's very proud that her daughters all have this good hair. And so when she disobeys her mother, her mother cuts her hair. So we had this wig and it had to get cut on stage every night. And that was, I don't even remember how we did it, but now I do. It's like, <laughs> 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 it was one of the things I work in the studio with Tom Watson, who does opera. And I'm like, Tom, how do you do this? Because I remember working, assisting Tom. And we did a musical and the woman had to cut her hair on stage. 
And so it, it was, it was every night you just have, for the next show, you'd have to re-rig it with thread and sew the piece. And so the hair wasn't really being cut. It was the piece being pulled out and the hair was already short. And there was a piece. Can I see the next slide? Maybe we'll show it. Uh, you, we do get to there, but I, these are just the, the uh, signs. Yeah, okay, this is Nidra, and she played one of the um, daughters. And this is actually the texture of Nidra's real hair. So, because Nidra has long, thick hair. And so we just wanted to make sure that I matched the texture of her real hair. No one ever knew she was really in a wig. Her friends all th thought that we dressed her hair at night. And Nidra always had to, another problem, well, challenge was Nidra was in and out of her tignon all the time. And you see them tie it on stage in front of the mirror. They had to tie these huge pieces of fabric on their head. And that was one of the things that's really great about collaboration on a level where the director took the time to let her practice it on the set, on the stage, during the scene. And we did it over and over until um, Liliana just kind of went, okay, are you comfortable? You think you can do that? And that's what true collaboration is. And next slide. And this is Janice getting her hair cut on stage. Her mother goes behind. Uh, everything helped with the illusion, the, the wheelchair, the height of the back of the wheelchair, so that she is looking, she's got these scissors and she's looking like she's just hacking away. And what she's doing is she's just pulling a piece off. And the challenge was when you cut the hair, the raw ends, we needed to see sliced ends. So it was rigging the piece that it had. You take a, like a ponytail and you, you do the ponytail, then you take and you take weft and you sew it on there and you cut it so you have that nice sliced end. So when she pulled it up, it really looked like her hair was cut. And then it took a while to figure out how long is her hair once it's cut? And where does it rest? And that took a, it started off being longer. And as we rehearsed, we, I just kept cutting it until it was as short as it could be so that it could be shocking that her hair got cut. Next slide. And we rehearsed that scene how many times, Montana? Over and over. That cutting, that cutting, that cutting, over and over and over again. But I think that you're right. I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned um, how um, essential it is for um, and, and helpful in these situations when you have a director who um, understands the importance of these moments and how we do our work. And a lot of times we have to do our work like I said, um, um, the, 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 the design is alive, it's always evolving. So we are doing, um, you know, we, that's one of those things we had to do it many, 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 many times to then figure out um, how, what was the best way to move forward. Mm -hmm. And then this character, so funny, she's got on this beautiful head wrap but in the telling of the story, when she takes off her head wrap, she has been hiding jewelry and stuff in her head wrap so that she can leave, um, sell it and leave. And so, can I see the next slide? Let me see if we have her. This is, um, this is what her hair looked like when the turban came off. But in there, in the turban, and this is a hair piece, because this actress was very, very, very particular, and she's worth every particular she wants. And um, she had to like wear this turban with all of this costume jewelry 
wrapped in it and she unwraps it on stage and this is what she we want we came up with something we didn't when she unwrapped her hair from the tinyon it was very important to her that um, she doesn't look crazy you know what i mean it's like you've been wearing this head wrap for the whole show and then at the end of the show you're going to take it off what does my hair look like underneath there and we didn't want her to she's a beautiful her own hairline of her hair is quite stunning so we decided i decided just to make her a hairpiece that she would attach to her own hair she was like a hands-on i'll do it kind of a girl well and that's that's interesting too and I'm, I'm glad we went through kind of like each each one and how we tailor because a lot of times it's well cookie you'll you'll it's mm. not it's a mix right sometimes you have real hair uh sometimes you have a wig sometimes you have a hybrid which is um using part of the actor's real hair and then adding an element um uh and, or we're working with the actor's own hair and all of those things all of those different paths have um different challenges and benefits you know a very often mm -hmm when um you know we, when we do the wig work well when cookie does her wig work it's what i love about it is that it always looks real unless it doesn't need to look real <laughs> unless it, unless unless it, it it's we're doing a different kind of show and it needs to look fake or like uh, artificial mm -hmm. but for the most part our point of departure is always that it looks real and so a very often having a wig doesn't always um trump using an actor's own hair, but this is something that we learn. You know, we always have a plan in developing the design. We can only know so much until we get into the room and first rehearsal with the actor. So, so there's, um, again, that element, that triangulation that happens, that is a, a beautiful part of the collaboration, which is the actor who uh, has their own relationship with their own hair um, can help guide us in the work that we've done so far. And, you know, the other thing that I wanted to say that we talk about all the time, Cookie, is that hair is sensitive and, and powerful and meaningful for everybody, all races. And all races. Let's just say that. All races. All races, you know, yes. very often there's a conversation about black hair and 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 specifically the needs of of black hair, which there are specific needs. But um, my experience in working with all different types of actors from all different backgrounds is that um, everybody has a sensitive and deep relationship to their hair. And so that's part of what, um, that's kind of one of the last steps in this whole design process into um, molding and honing um, these characters. And yeah. yeah, and also with the thing, the thing too is yes, you must talk to the actor. You must talk to the director. You must talk to the costume designer. You must talk to the sound person if there's any sort of microphones being used. You know, you must talk to the lighting people so that, you know, sometimes they can help you in, in creating an illusion. And, but in the midst of all of that, you must tell the story. And telling the story, informing the audience, being period correct and it's all about silhouettes and and you know black hair has been black hair forever so it's you know so but the same the silhouette a gibson on a black woman is the same as a gibson on a white woman the silhouette is there so we must be very careful in having actors not help it not tell the story by insisting that they want a certain type of hair. I want this, I want this. If it's not telling the story, 
then we have work to do. And how do we tell the story, help the actor feel that they have some input in the telling of the story, keeping them honest to the period and what would really happen during that time. That's one of my big deals. Yeah. I, but look at her, she's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that I that's something in your work, Cookie, that I really do appreciate when you say that word honest. It's very honest. It's very real. The the attempt is to to, to almost not notice the hair, <laughs> right? Like right. Not, that's like it. there's there's um, there's something valuable about these little things. Well, they're not little. There's something valuable about the visual minutia that is so important to your process. Um, but the end result is an honesty and an honesty in character. And I often, and I feel like that's such an important um, emotional and psychological part of the process, right? Because that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's still part of the process. And it's still, t we have to tell the story. Yeah. You know? And that's the thing that I always say. And I, you know, talking to actors, it's like, yeah, that's great. But it's that helping tell the story. If they can, if, if an actor can justify to me, Cookie, I want it this way because this character would never blah, 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 I've been, you know what I mean? And it's like, okay, well, let's tell the story. And then I rely on the costume designer and the director to say, nah. <laughs> it's like, and a lot of times we just do things. I love working with Montana. We do things. I said, look, Montana, this is not going to be the way. But the actress really wants to try this style, this color. Can we just let her wear it for rehearsal? And I talk to the uh, director and, uh, and say, can we just let them get it out of their system, wear it? Because most actors do want to tell the story. They put it on, they get the reactions from the other actors, and they're like, you know, let's try the other wig. <laughs> you know, because they want to tell the story. They well, you know, them. one thing that you you're also that you that you know that I that I think is one of the most valuable parts of the process, right, is um, that first fitting with the actors, mm -hmm. right? Because we've had, uh, you know, a theoretical idea to the design with the director, me, and you. And mm -hmm. then we steward that conversation into the first fitting. But by the time we get to the first fitting, very often that actor has been embodied with this character mm -hmm. and knows things that we could never know because they've been living with this character. And so I'm always excited to meet the actors and kind of have that first conversation about like, you know, it really is kind of a dance. It's like, here's what we think, this is the world that we'd like to step into. And very mm -hmm. often, they also add to the palette with their ideas. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I really, that's what I really love that Cookie and I are able to, we remain really flexible. Um, I think that there's a danger, especially in theatrical design, to not be as malleable and flexible as the process requires, right? right? Um, and so each actor, each performer, each show is a different journey. Even the same actor, because we work with multiple actors over and over, and yeah, the same, even the same actor on a different show is a different process. And so I think that that is um, at the core of how we approach things, which is, I think, um, there's a lot of communication, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of a lot direct, of clear communication, yeah. communication, 
no idea is really wrong. It sounds mm -hmm. kind of trite, but I'm just trying to think through kind of like some yeah. of the things that we don't, that. And don't just know. to have the actors feel, male, female, that they, if they feel it's wrong, that say it, you know what I mean? It's okay, there's, there's no right, there's no wrong. It's just not right, you're not feeling right. It may look great, maybe, but if you don't feel right in it, what can we do to help you feel right in it? Yeah, and I think yeah. often when those situations happen, right, where the actor does feel like they need to communicate, this isn't, this isn't working for me, this isn't mm -hmm. getting it. I think that they're often surprised that we're like, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, cool. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like I see what you're saying. So like, what do we, how do we move forward? Like, what do we mm -hmm. do next? Um, mm -hmm. And it's always like, there's, I feel like there's never with the team that we have, because I, I think it's also important to mention um, the, the people that we work with, like uh, Jessica, and Serafina, both of my, my assistants. And, and Joya, my assistant, Joya, um, Eli, yeah. Yeah, because it really is a team effort. And I feel like with the team that we um, have amassed, this family, that there's really no challenge that we can't really take on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, um, yeah. I think, should we open it up for Q&A, Erin? Oh, and another Let's thing I want to say about, about um, collaborating and working with a costume designer and a team that supports you. Um, I work very hard so people have real, realistic expectations of cost. And it, a lot of times, theaters, producers, they want that quality, but have not a clue what that quality costs. To have it in a tiny theater, women are in wigs, and we don't look at lace. You know what I mean? Because for that show, remember, we made it all and just before we got to photos, I cut all the lace off of those wigs because the theater is very small. And I didn't want anyone to be distracted by the lace. Mm -hmm. We've worked so hard to make it. One of the questions I always ask directors and costume designers is, so is that, especially if we're talking about black hair, I go, so is that a black woman who wears a wig? Or is that wig, is that hair growing out of her head? What look do you want? Do you want it to be a black woman who wears a wig? And that's part of the story. Or do we want that hair to look like it's growing out of their head? And that's financially two different things. Yeah, and I think it, it's it's we showed the process pictures with the uh, with the uh, heads the the mm -hmm. wig head, but I think it's important to know on a show like The House That Will Not Stand that each one of those wigs is hand tied with mm -hmm. human hair to net, um, and the process is just how how many hours does it take Cookie to make one of the wigs? Forty, fifty hours yeah mm -hmm. um and so so that's part of the i think the hidden cost of wig expense is that, mm -hmm. that the labor is not often always known mm -hmm. i'm working on something now where the one wig is ten thousand dollars it's a film but the one wig because they want to be able to zoom in close, 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 close. And that is some information, which means that most of the front of the wig is not only lace, film lace, where if you pull too hard, the lace will rip. So it's, you know, so the front of the wig, what, 
just the front, a little bit like this. The front of the wig could be anywhere from 35 to 40 hours, one week on the front. Because you have to do it so slow, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can open up for questions, yeah? Oh, thank you both so much for your generosity and sharing those images and sharing your process. It is, I have such strong um, memories and feelings about both of those pieces and it's amazing to be back in a virtual, vir virtual room with them. Um, folks, if you have questions, feel free to write them in the Q&A or you can write them in the chat. I will say that uh, we got a message from Nidra on Facebook who said, hi, oh. I've just logged in to see, to hear lovely Cookie saying my name, love and miss you both. <laughs> um, so she is, she is sending her regards. Um, let's see, what, there was a very specific question, which was how much, and you mentioned that it was synthetic hair, but um, a question about how much hair was used in Amelia's wig for, in Death of the Last Black Man. Oh my goodness, how much hair. She had a wig and then the crown went over the wig. So how much, what was the question? There was a, the question was how much hair did you use when the picture of that wig was up? I don't oh, know if it's- uh, Oh, those are what we call Beulah braids. And, and the only thing that Montana wouldn't let me use was a dreadlock on it. And so it was, I just sort of bought, it's what we, I call them Beulah braids, synthetic hair, to make the hair, the crown. Yeah. And then, yeah, just how many packs of hair, I don't know. But then, but then she also had, what you, you, she had a wig on, but the thing is, is that wig was a human hair wig, right? So then you already have two types of hair. And then we had to braid the reason we did the the wig mm -hmm. is because we had to it was part of the infrastructure that helped that wig stand up so or the 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 structure stand up so the wig itself was braided and that's actually what we attached the wig to mm -hmm. that? yep so it's well it's one of those things where to attach the crown to it underneath the crown on the wig the reason we wanted a wig was that circle of magnets oh, that's yeah. how we held it on magnets were sewn into the wig and into the um the head headpiece and so you lined it up and it would just click on and that was to help her um, we couldn't pin it on because it would flop, and we had to do right. it because pants. she was dancing. Remember? Yeah. So it was. It took a while to figure it out. I still have it. It's for rent. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, I'm curious for each of you. What is the way into? a process or is even when you're deciding whether you're going to take a, a job or not is there a re is it a, do you read the script do you talk to the director what is each of your way in to uh the beginning of a creative process well with it always starts off with the costume first you have the direct writer director costume designer and then wig designer so usually when, if Montana asks me to do something, the answer is yes. And then we go from there and then it's like, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what? and we talk about the needs of the show, what he's seeing, how the director is seeing it. He gets all of that information and then we meet and we talk. Mm -hmm. And you have something to say, Montana? Um, yeah, I was, yeah, I was gonna say that there is kind of a, there's a mm -hmm. timeline in terms of how things happen. But one of the things that's really nice, I was going to mention, um, you know, we're in early workshops for um, Michael R. Jackson's White Girl in Danger. And <laughs> they have invited both Cookie and I to be there because there's a lot of hair story in it. There's a lot of, you know, and so it's kind of exciting to be um, part of 
of the process earlier than you than we normally would be. Um, right. At what point do you yeah, normally not, feel like you get invited into a process? Um, well, it's very, you know, often, I think that, I think that for the most part, these trusted relationships with the directors, if a director approaches me, a lot of times I feel like um, with certain directors that I know and love, they've, they have chosen me for the job because I'm the right designer for this particular job. So there's already, I think that part of my in is a trust in mm. their invitation to the project. Um, and then, you know, um, and then I, you know, and then I take my own personal delve into it, reading the play, talking with Cookie, going back and talking with the director. Um, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Sunidra, or she has two questions actually. Um, one was a question about what would you do with a play like in the Heights? And then the other was, have you done multi-race plays? Um, yes, we do, we do, we do all types <laughs> of plays. Um, the two plays that I'm focused on for this are Black Stories, but, um, yeah, we've been, we've done all kinds of productions with all different types of actors. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, it is really interesting. Like I was mentioning earlier about the universality of the process, right? Each one of each, each, each project has its own universe, but there's a way in which, um, uh, race, uh, like I was saying with the hair, everybody's sensitive about hair, mm -hmm. right? Well, um, my background is, you know, I, I, I was trained in the opera world. I didn't start doing black hair till I came to New York. I traveled the country doing operas. Madam Butterfly. I mean, I can do any kind of hair. I am a wig master, which means I can do any kind of hair. Um, and people assume because you do black hair, you can't do any other hair. Um, you have to do white people hair. That's a given. Whatever school you go to, they're going to teach you how to do white people hair. So we have to know how to do white people hair just to get our foot in the door. Then the black hair is something that I know because I'm black and I see things out there and I go, well, that's not right. But it's like, so it's, you have to know white people hair and don't know it. And I think it should be both ways. I think that, you know, when you go to these schools, you should learn about black hair and you should learn about white hair. You should learn about hair. And that's all of it. Yeah, and that actually makes me think of when, you, when, you're, when you're saying that, it makes me think of a lot of ways that, like in a lot of ways that theater education was specifically costume design education, a lot of it is inherently based on like, um, a Western silhouette timeline, right? Like you have mm -hmm. to learn these Western silhouettes in order to know um, period correct clothing. Um, and so in a lot of ways, even if, right, the story is a black story or let's say, um, there's always a mix of, of like how we're approaching it. Even, you know, even if it's not like a multiracial show, we're always having these influences from um, mm -hmm. uh, many directions. Mm -hmm. So the question was about you doing In the Heights. <laughs> there is oh, yeah, you know, um, I think that we would do, I mean, I think we would approach In the Heights like we would approach any other show, right, Cookie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, and especially something like that, which is more, um, 
let's say current, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a while ago, but in in terms of a clothing right. vernacular, um, that's also um, a type of design that, for the most part, the sh the shows that I have that we've gone through today were built shows, right? And there's another type of design, which is um, sourcing, purchasing, going to stocks, things like that. And so for like a show like in the Heights where you would be doing a lot more sourcing and buying, um, there is that conversation with the actor even becomes a bigger part of the collaboration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of how I approach things is for a modern show, usually I'll do um, a collage of imagery, the world that we're trying to figure out, um, the world that we'd be looking for out, uh, outside in, in, in the shops through the pieces and, um, and carefully curating what we buy mm -hmm. to make sure that it's not like we we're going to the store and we're buying the whole rack of clothes. Like we go in, we, you know, me and Jessica, we measure, we make sure that this is something that could potentially work. So all of the things that we bring in is a carefully curated, and then we work with the actor to figure out their thoughts on it. So any kind of modern show is gonna function like that, where we're bringing in an offering <laughs> and the actor is giving us an offering in return. Yeah. And like in the Heights, it's a, you know, it's a particular culture. So there is, um, there's a hair, you know, a beauty salon in that show. I know Paul Taswell, he's a really good friend. And when, before it was even on Broadway, when, when it was off Broadway, you know, it was like, it is, it's, it's its own sort of community that you're trying to create for that show. And once again, Skin color will tell you the texture. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it will tell you a darker Dominican has different hair texture. So. Thank you. Um, the last question I had was maybe, maybe it would have made more sense as a first question, but like, what got you both into the work that you are doing and what keeps you in the work that you are doing? Well, Montana has as many degrees as, ask him <laughs> to tell you about all the degrees. <laughs> he started off as an oboe player. Okay, yeah, I guess, I guess I'll go first. He's a musician, classical trained musician. Um, I, I, um, yeah, I went to Oberlin for undergrad and studied oboe and history. Um, at the end of that time, I became very interested in art history. So eventually I went to an art history program at Brown, which Aaron, I think you went to Brown, right? I did. Yes. I, don't know <laughs> who, I was there until 2010. Were we there together or did we just- I graduated in 2010 from the master's program. Oh, so there so, we were. We're and, yeah, yeah, we're there, yeah. Into yeah. Each other. <laughs> I digress, I digress. But in the last semester of that program, um, I'd become really interested in uh, how um, museums use design to create narrative space. So I thought, because um, I was doing a curatorial program, and I, so I took intro to set design, which was an undergrad course. Um, and I fell in love with the theater. It would be some years later that I found out that I was a costume designer, um, but I taught myself how to draw. Um, well, actually my friend Lewis, who's a graffiti artist, is the first person who um, kind of like encouraged me to draw. So we would sit together and we would draw together um, because I knew that part, drawing was a big part of the language and the skill set that you would need for theater. So. Um, and eventually I went to Yale um, for uh, the MFA in design. And um, I graduated in 2015. And pretty much, I guess the second part of that question is why do you stay in it? And it's, I think that, you know, while costume is a lot of work, it's a lot of labor, um, 
it's a lot of time. I think that there's something so special about um, the element of being able to play make-believe for a living, you know, and we're always delving into these stories and each story is interesting and you're always learning a lot and um, everything's so communal and there's, you know, and the way we work, it's really a family. So I think part of what now is keeping me in the theater is my theater family. It's too, uh, it's too late for me to change. So this is it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this since 1970, you know, so I don't think, but I've learned a lot. You know, every time I do a show, I learn more. You never stop learning. There's so much to know. Hair is changing now in the theater and on Broadway and in the movies. Hopefully it'll get better. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, this, this is what I do. I have a little studio here in Santa Fe and waiting for a wig and waiting for some hair to come in, a in the mail. I'm doing a wig for, um, doing a wig for an actress who's filming in New Zealand. Mm. So, gotta, gotta get it. Amazing. The last Everybody pray for me. I don't have any water in my house. It's been a month. Right. <laughs> and it's gonna be another month. Send sending. some good vibes. <laughs> sending, sending some good vibes. Um, Cookie, the last question that just came in was, do you have advice for a young wig master attempting to learn to ventilate? Um, yeah, learn. Um, go to, um, just do your research and learn from the best. And her name, her, there is a website called I Make Wigs. And her name is Gretchen, and she's an excellent, excellent teacher. She lives in Atlanta, and she does virtual classes, if you can't go there. But she is one of the best. She's, she cleaned up my act. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did. She made me a much better wig maker. Uh, Montana Cookie, thank you so much for your generosity and for spending some time with us this afternoon. It has been really, um, really heartening and wonderful to be with you, to be with you both and Cookie sending you all of the good vibes, sending you both all of the good vibes. Um, <laughs> thank you. To plug a little bit of what we have upcoming just for the folks who are watching, um, next Wednesday at 1 p.m. we have a performing masterclass with Maria Dizia that is called Never Any More Perfection Than There Is Now. Uh, Maria was in our production of Belleville in 2013 and was touring the country in What the Constitution Means to Me um, until mm -hmm. COVID forced it to uh, close early or suspend itself early. Um, and then in two weeks on Wednesday the 14th at 11 to 30 a.m. we have a fireside chat with the Sea Lighting Foundation. Um, and the Sea Lighting Foundation was a foundation that was started in the spring uh, for immigrant designers confronted with the lack of support and the immigrant theater artists confronted with the lack of support to get immediate support to folks in need during the COVID crisis. Um, and as I said at the beginning, this class and chat and all of our classes and chats are free and available um, for everybody to view now and in perpetuity at nycw.org. Uh, we're going to post a link in the chat with some a survey for feedback. We always love to hear how we're doing and how we could do better. And finally, again, if you're in a position to do so, please make consider making a donation in honor of this class to the New Mexico Community Foundation, Native American Relief Fund, um, or to the workshop to support our ongoing programming. Montana, Cookie, thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day. I hope you can enjoy the sun if you're here in New York. And we'll be with you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Take care of yourself. Bye. Bye. You Bye. Well. Bye.